the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Let's go before the Lord. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord. And we are just a grateful, grateful, grateful people tonight as we put our hearts before you and say, Lord, speak in our hearts, and God will give you the praise. Bless us this night as we gather over the word of the Lord. Let the teacher of the church, who is the Holy Spirit, come and teach us the word of the Lord, and God will give you the praise. But also, Lord, not only blessing us, but bless all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are our brothers and our sisters. We love them, Lord. No time do we think of ourselves as better than them, but Lord, we ask that you would bless them. And God will give you the praise, give you the glory, give you all the honor. In Jesus, mighty name with a great big shout, we all say amen. amen. Before I get into the message, I just want to tell you something about this weekend. It's our Miracle Birthday Offering Weekend, and what that means is that what we do at this church is we do something real special, is we all get together, we bring the very best offering, economic offering to the Lord as a, a blessing that with the church takes and uses to repair the church and keep the church up and pay the expenses and do all the things we need to. And uh, it can be a one-time gift or it could be a one-year pledge gift, which a lot of people take advantage of. And we, we bring that in and then we just believe God. It's over and above your tithes and your offerings. And God spoke to me this last week. And I, I don't know if I mentioned it on Wednesday night or not. I'm not sure I did. But last week, and I, I shared it all through the whole weekend with the weekend services, that uh, when God spoke to me, I was just surprised because I really hadn't gotten into this miracle birthday offering this year. I, I was kind of like wanting to shut it down because of recession, recession and all that kind of stuff. And really kind of you know, discouraged about it. And then God spoke to me and it just lit me up like a candle. And he said these words. He said, uh, my house and their house, or what he was really saying was this. He says, if they'll get involved, tell them, if they'll get involved by paying off my house, I'll get involved in paying off their house. And I don't know about you, but I just would like to believe God for a house free and clear instead of having some mortgage company. Now, not only here at the church, but you personally in your house. Someday you're going to own a house, why not own free and clear? Now, you can believe that if you don't want to believe it. I don't really give a flip. I'm too old to care. I just know that God spoke it to me, and that's your call whether you believe it or don't believe it. But we're going to get together. We're going to bring a, 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 a special offering on the Lord. Church going to take that offering, do things with it. But one of the main things we're going to do is start paying off the church. The church uh, spends $85,000 every month on a mortgage payment. So over the next few years, we want to pay this off. $85,000 a month going into mission fields would be great. $85,000 a month. You know, we've fed almost a quarter million people this year already. Would be great to feed, you know, even twice that many, buy some more trucks, reach more people, taking care of the people that are in need. We just really are looking forward to doing that and getting us out of that mortgage payment. And I believe that God made that statement about you and not only your church, but also about your own personal house. So think about it, pray about it, talk to God about it, and uh, let's do this. Let's bring our best unto the Lord this weekend, and let's celebrate on Sunday night because we're going to have a party afterwards. It's going to be great. Hey, listen, what we've been doing on Wednesday nights has been kind of fun. We've been talking about biblical economics. We've been talking about biblical financial pro, uh, situations. I, we're, we're, what we're doing is we're trying to find out by looking at the Word of God what God says about finances. So many people have so many ideas, you know. You hear this preacher, and he's got this idea about finances. All you have to do is give, and everything's going to be great. But I really find that not true. It's not about just giving. It's about your heart. It's about integrity. It's about your life with God. It's about a relationship with God. It's about honesty. And it's about purity. It's about you growing up and me growing up into a place of maturity. And then God starts to bless us. And blessings don't always come in the form of financial blessings, even though God is not against financial blessings. You'd have to be really a spiritually stupid person to believe that God doesn't want to bless you economically. 
because it's all through the scripture. In fact, he talks more about economic conditions in scripture, which is really funny, than he does mention salvation in scripture. So God knows that really you're tied to your wallet more than you know. And it's awfully uh, sometimes a shame for us to be that tied to our finances when we need to be tied to the things of the Lord and God's ways. And we're looking at what the Bible says about the Word of God. We've had a great time over this last month, month and a half, in talking about the subject. And tonight it's going to be a lot of fun because we're talking about economic stewards for God. I don't know about you, but I want to become an economic steward for God. We've said a couple of things. I hope they've registered. Let's talk about them just for a moment. Number one, we've said it all belongs to God anyway. And God gives it to you, and what you do with it depends on whether or not you're going to get more from God. It's all God's. You didn't, you didn't, you say, well, I earned it. God gave you the job, gave you the energy, gave you the heartbeat, gave you the breath to go earn it, gave you the job, kept you there, kept you healthy, everything, and it's all God's. God, and God belongs. There isn't anything that you have that God doesn't have. It belongs to him, and he's given it to us, and we're to do something with it. We're to be good stewards. Remember, we talked about that. The better steward you are of what God gives you, the more likely God's going to give you more because and I'll show that to you and prove that to you tonight by the scripture if you're a lousy steward of what you have that God gives you even if it's a very small thing not just a big thing but a very small thing then you'll find that God will not continue giving people that are uh, can't even handle the small things and so God's looking for a people, according to the scripture, that can handle the blessings of the Lord. And we're talking about money. We're talking about finances. We're talking about how you deal with those things that are constantly in your life that put pressure. You deal with them every single day of your life called finances. What's the Bible say about it? If it's so important, we spend a lot of time working for it. We spend a lot of time saving for it. We spend a lot of time spending it. We spend a lot of time and put a lot of effort energy, mind thoughts, heart thoughts on money, my goodness, then what in the world does God say about it? And that's what we've been doing week after week after week. So today is not going to be any different whatsoever. Let me just say this again to you. Again, how good of a steward you are will determine how much God will allow you to steward of his commodities. Are you following me? And that means anything. You could take that to your marriage. You could take that to your children. You could take that about your jobs. You could take that about your finances. Uh, what you do with what you have has a lot to do with where you're going and what you will become. And if you don't deal with it the right way, and that's what we're learning, then you'll find yourself tied up wondering why God doesn't bless you economically. And you keep working and working and working. And it's like having a bag the Bible describes with holes in it. You put your money in the bag and it just goes away and you don't have anything. And then all of a sudden you find yourself horribly frustrated, blaming God because you've done some things, but you haven't done the right things. You haven't done it the right way. Keep in mind that you can do the right things the wrong way and still be out of sync with God. Now let me say it again. You could do the right things the wrong way and still be out of sync with God. For an example, the children of Israel, I've used that illustration a hundred times for you, but the children of Israel get released from Egypt. They come over, they worship the wrong God. They worship the God that delivered them from Egypt. That's the right thing, but they did it the wrong way by making a golden calf. God makes them grind it up. So it was the right thing, the wrong way, and they ended up eating it because God said, grind it up and eat it because it's not me at all. I'm not a golden calf. I am God Almighty. And so we find ourselves really zeroing in on some major truths as we look at the word of the Lord. Tonight, I want to take you into Matthew, the 25th chapter. It's called the parable of the talents, but I, I think that's the wrong title for it. It ought to be the parable of the stewards, because God is going to give us some illustrations about how people steward the right way and the wrong way. And then, you know what's kind of neat about tonight? Is we're not only going to look at the, the story of the parable of the steward, but we're also going to look at the life of one of the stewards, how he messed up, listen to this, why he messed up, 
so that we can check ourselves out to make sure that we're not in the wrong place with God. Is that all right? So first of all, I'm going to start reading out of the 14th verse of the 25th chapter of Matthew. This is Jesus giving a parable. Now, let me explain to some of you that are new that you may not understand the word parable. It's not something, you know, that we use all the time, like, how's your parable? Have you got a parable for me? You know, well, I got a parable, but I, you know, we don't know what that really means. It's a story analogy that gives you insight in a spiritual reality. So here it is, it'll tell you something very spiritual, but it's a simple story that Jesus is illustrating, an analogy of a biblical truth. Is that okay? So here we're looking at this, which is a biblical truth. Let's see if we can make some sense out of it and talk about it just a little bit. Let's take a look, if you will, at verse number 14, 15, 25th chapter of Matthew. We're talking about economic stewards for God, and we're talking about being a good steward, and this, to me, is a parable of the steward. Verse number 14 says, for the kingdom of heaven is like, you'll find that Jesus does this all the time, as he starts off with the kingdom of heaven is like, he's now starting into a parable, telling you about what a spiritual life is like. Is that okay? Because if you're going to do it the right way instead of the wrong way, you're going to do the right thing, remember, the wrong way and still be out of sync with God. If you're going to do it the right way, you better learn what God's ways are. And that's why we're looking. Are you, do I have your attention? He says this, the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. Stop right there. Notice these words, his own servants, his own servants, and he delivered his goods to them. It's like God leaving is what he's describing. Jesus is going to heaven, and now his servants that are connected with him, he's going to give him the stuff that it belongs to him, and they're going to have to watch over that stuff and do the right thing with this stuff. Now, whatever that stuff is, in this particular case, it's money. But whatever it could be, it could be the family you have, it could be your marriage, it could be your children, it could be the jobs you have. All of that relates to this stuff. So here we're going to look at it in terms of money. So he calls his own servants. So he didn't just call anybody servants. He calls his own servants. Now, I don't know about you, but a servant is somebody who works for the best interest of the master. So let's understand what the word servant means. Because without that, we just kind of got this bizarre thought about the word servant. A servant is somebody who works for the best interest of the master. Whatever the master says, whatever the master does, whatever is better for the master, it's kind of like an employee that is working for an employer. He is like the servant to the employer wanting to do the very best for the employer so the employee gets in there and works. And that's what the word servant is kind of telling us about. And he delivers his goods, not their goods, not somebody else's goods, but his goods. And I told you earlier that Jesus in a parable is describing it here, but here earlier, Jesus got it all. This is all his. What you have is his. How you deal with it has something to do with it. And he's going to give you something, but what he's going to give you is dependent upon how you deal with it. So let's take a look at it. In verse number 14, it makes it very clear. Verse 15, let's go to verse number 15. Verse number 15, it says, And one he gave five talents, and to another he gave two, and to another he gave one. Stop right there. Um, A lot of times people read that. To one servant he gave five talents. The word talent means money. It's like, uh, let's just take it like a $100 gold piece or something, okay? It means money. So it's what a talent was in those days. To one servant he gave five. To another servant he gave two. And to another servant he gave one. First thing we do in America is we come along and we make this statement. That's not fair. He got five, he got two, he got one. We should all be on the same page with the same amount. But notice this, God's too smart for that. And he goes on in that very same verse and he says this. He says, to each according to his own ability. In other words, God's not giving the guy that should handle one five. He's not giving the guy uh, that should handle two uh, five. He's not giving the guy that can only handle one uh, two. He's going to give them according to the ability. Why? Because he's the master. In other words, if they've been tested for five and can handle five, they'll give them five according to their ability. If they'll give them two according to their ability, or one according to their ability. Notice that everybody gets something. There's not a fourth party in there that says, this guy didn't get anything. Too bad, sucker, you're out. 
He doesn't say that. Everybody gets something. So in the kingdom of God, everybody's going to get something. But it's according to how you deal with it. Are you following me? And the master knows your heart. So a lot of times people say, well, I don't have anything from God. Maybe there's something we need to check about our own personalities. About lining up with God. Because it's really according to whether or not you can handle the five that you get the five. It's really according to whether you can handle the two that you get the two. And it's really according, man, the basic bottom thing. You got the one, start there, do the right thing, and then you'll get the two. But my goodness, you're not going to get more beyond one until your abilities on uh, handling what you have proves that you can handle it. Because if you don't handle it properly, here's what wealth does. It'll handle you. Is anybody listening? It'll handle you, and it'll drive you away. And how many people do you know over the lifetime who've gone for the bucks instead of gone for God, got the bucks, and then lost God? I mean, it just happens on a constant basis. It's like stupid. What does it gain a, a man if he gains a whole world and loses his soul, the Bible says? You know, so here he comes along, verse number 15, verse number 16, verse 15, let's go there. And immediately he went on a journey. So here's the master. He's gone. He left it with his stewards. The, the analogy here is Jesus in heaven, he's given it to us. Is that okay? Verse number 16, let's take a look at verse 16. It says this, and then he who had received five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. Now, I, I, I just want you to kind of like make a note that it doesn't say anything about this guy except immediately. Soon as he left immediately, he left the five talents with this guy. The very next word is then. I should have highlighted the word then. Then means bang. No sooner was he out of sight than this guy goes to work. Is somebody listening? And he takes the five talents, he went and he traded them, and he made five more talents. Let's go on, verse number, if you will, 17. And likewise, notice the word likewise up there. Likewise means the guy that got two talents saw the guy, he's just like that guy, just what he did, you know, he's going to do it. He saw that guy go out immediately and make five to ten, and now he's going to take his two and go do the same thing with it. So likewise, he who received two gained two more also. But then it comes along, verse number uh, 18, and makes it very clear. He says, but he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. So all of a sudden, this guy does something completely different. He didn't take after the guy that got the five, didn't take after the guy that had the two. He does his own thing, and he comes to a place, and he says, God, is, or the master, in our case God, has given me something, and uh, I, 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 I better put it in the ground and make it safe. That sounds like a pretty good idea, but is it is the question. And he comes along, verse number 19, and notice the word Lord's money. Can I back you up to verse number 18 for a second? Uh, it says this, hit it in the ground and hit his Lord's, what was in that last word there? Money. We're talking about money. Yeah. But now here comes verse number 19. In verse number 19, after a long time, the Lord of these servants came to settle the accounts with them. Verse number 20. And so he had received a five talents, came and brought him five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered unto me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. In other words, you've given me something according to my ability, and I did it. And then he comes along, he makes this statement in verse number 21. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things, and I will make you ruler over many. Enter into the joy of the Lord. In other words, his master, or in our particular cases, look at this, the Lord is happy with what the guy got and what he did with what he got. Are we following each other? And he says, because you've done it the right way on these five, he says, listen to these, I'm going to make you ruler over many things. In other words, before you become ruler, you better be able to handle the little things in life. So many times people say, I just want to be the boss. Oh, that's cool. You want to be that, but you better be the ruler and better dictate and get in there and make something work, the things of God right off the bat on little things before you get the big things. It doesn't work any other way with God. You'll start somewhere, and you're like everybody else, according to his, 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 uh, his uh, giftings, according to his abilities, he got the five. So God knew who he was, or his master knew his abilities. 
And he got to five. And he says, enter in to the joy of the Lord. Verse number 22 comes along and makes this statement. As also he had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more besides them. Have you ever noticed how the guy that has two talents literally follows the guy that has the five talents? I mean, almost word for word for what he says, the five talents, the guy with the two talents says the same thing, doesn't he? He comes along in verse number 22. He says, I've made, look and see. He said, I've gained two more talents besides them. The Lord said to him, now in verse number 23, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things and I will make you ruler over many things. In other words, a lot of times we want to be rulers, but you can't be rulers until you're faithful for the master's giving. And when you, when you can be faithful to the little things, then he makes you faithful. He knows he can trust you with the big things. Is anybody listening? And, and can I just say something? I don't want to offend anybody. I'm not here to offend you. I'm, I'm here to build you up. Most people that go to American churches, most people don't know how to handle their finances in a way that blesses the Lord. And they want to be ruler over a lot of things. They want to control the life that they live in, but they haven't done it yet with the little things, and they're expecting God just to come in and wave some magic wand or Tinkerbell to fly over and drop some gold dust on us and get us where we need to be. It doesn't work that way. You're going to have to be faithful over the little things I don't know how long that is before you become ruler over the big things. And without that understanding, he says, and enter into the joy of the Lord. Now I want you to know something. Happiness is for a little bit, but joy is forever. <laughs> happiness, you want happiness, you go to Disneyland for a few hours, you get on the ride in an hour and 15 minutes instead of an hour and 45. <laughs> That's happiness. And it only lasts for a while until the ride is over. And you've been on the right 800 times in your life. You know what I'm talking about. It's nothing new. I've seen Michael Jackson go backwards how many times? My goodness sakes alive. They got a new ride out there. I think it was like 50 times you could go on it and not see the same one. You never know. So it's, they're getting progressive that way. Keep you coming back. But that's happiness. Joy is forever. I like that. Come on now. I, I don't want, I, anybody can find happiness. I got to find the joy. He says, enter into the joy of the Lord. Jesus says, my joy is part of the fruit of the spirit for your life. I don't know about you, but boy, that's important to me. Comes along and makes that statement to him. He says it, and it's pretty good. Verse number 24. And he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I know you. To be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and, and gathering where you have not scattered seed. Verse number 25. And I was afraid, and I went and hid the talent in the ground, and look, here it is, what, you, what is yours. Verse number 26. But his Lord answered and said to him, now, this is really interesting. The guy doesn't do anything with what he has except give it back to God with nothing involved in it makes a statement about God. And this is where this whole thing just opens up and we can really get some wisdom out of this. And God says to him, you wicked servant. And when you stop and look at this, and I, I just want to share something with you. What is it that, and it, I think it's important for us to see, is that the, the question really comes to a place of, uh, what stops the servant from being a good servant? What stops this servant from being a good steward? I mean, something's going to stop him. There's a series of events that brings him to a place where God looks at him and calls him a wicked servant. You slothful person. And it's really fascinating at that time when we start to look at this. I mean, what are these things? First of all, you're going to have to understand, I want to share with you tonight why this guy who had one did nothing with his one. Here's why I want to share it with you. Because God gives you one, and you better make sure you do something right with it. Because if you don't, the same thing is going to be spoken over your life as well as mine. Because we're really accountable for being Christians. And we're really accountable for what God has for us. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Now, in order to understand this, let's take a look at some things. Number one, first thing you say, well, fear brought him to this place. It's not true. 
the, it wasn't fear at all. But here's the very first thing that caused him to fail in his decision-making process. Tick off his Lord and Savior. And then he ends up being cast in the burning flames forever. Worthless. I mean, that's pretty hard, pretty harsh. Here's the first thing. Lack of true understanding of who God is. Before the fear, lack of true understanding of who God is. Let me show you what I mean by that. He comes along and he makes this statement. He says this, these words, and they're fascinating words. He says, Lord, I know you. See, you can know God and not understand God. You can know God and not understand God. He has a problem. He has a problem of lack of true understanding of who God is. And he makes this statement, says, I know you. You're a hard, to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. Verse number 24. My goodness, he just made a statement that's absolutely rude. He says, you reap where you haven't put anything in. And you gather where you haven't sprinkled any seeds. You don't do anything and you get a profit. Well, let me ask you something. Personally, that would have bothered me. Wouldn't it bother you if someone made a statement like that to you? Of course it would. But the problem with it is, is this, is that the master acknowledges that to be true. Listen to what it says. He goes on. He says in verse number 20, he says, and I was afraid. He says, and I went and I hid my talent in the ground. There, And the Lord answered and said, you wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I do not, have not sown and gather where I do not scatter seeds. In other words, this guy knows it. And yet his understanding with God was brought him to a place of fear and it brought him to a place of fear because he so misunderstood God that he knew that God was one who reaps. In other words, he, God doesn't have to sow to reap. God doesn't have to scatter seed to get a harvest. It all belongs to God. Does he need this guy to take his one and make it two? No. He needs this guy to trust him. You follow me? He says, you know who I am. You said it for yourself. So we can know who God is and not understand about God. We can come along and say, I know God. I quote scriptures. I can be a Christian. I can sing those songs. And then when it comes right down to it, man, we bury what God gives us because we're really afraid of the situation. By the way, lack of true understanding brings you to number two. Number two is fear. And verse number 25, he says, I was afraid. Lack of true understanding. Lack of the fact that I'm God who doesn't need to sow to reap, doesn't need to, to, to scatter to gather. I'm God that gets a profit no matter what because it's all mine. The earth is mine, the Bible says. So this guy, number two, makes a problem. His first problem is he has a lack of true understanding. second problem, his lack of true understanding brings him to a place, if you will, of fear. And fear just stifles people. And causes them never to accomplish anything. Because they're afraid. In fact, you'll find where there's the presence of God, it was never designed for the God's people to be in such fear of God that they would stop from action. Fear was to come upon the, those that were contrary to the ways of God, not those that are God's people. There is a fear of God that's reverence and respect, but there's also the other fear of God that says, man, I'm not messing with you. And the, God, the, the guy that says, comes along and says, I'm not messing with you. He needs to understand that. But if you're a Christian, his mercy is for you. His blessings are on you. He's gone before you. He loves you. He wants to take care of you. He wants to provide for you. You don't have to fear him. When you fear him, you have no real understanding of who he is. But you should fear him if you're screwing around. Because he's not one to trifle with. So, a lack of true understanding brings him to a place of being afraid, which brings him to a place of faint-heartedness. Faint-heartedness means that you don't have courage anymore 
about what you're supposed to do. You see, the guy that had the five had faith and confidence that God would take care of it and his master would be just. And he didn't mind because if he lost it, he lost it because his master is the one that reaps where he hasn't sown anyway. And he goes out and he puts the five and he barters for it and makes five more. But the guy that had the one, he was afraid. And when, because he was afraid, he got faint-hearted. Faint-hearted means you can't make faith decisions. And you're constantly afraid. God puts a blessing in front of this guy. He says, no, I can't do it. I'm not going to do it. Just like the children of Israel. God takes them to the promised land. In fact, if you want to see it just for kind of fun, look at Numbers, the 14th chapter, verse number 3. God takes them to the edge of the promised land. Now, God has delivered them from Egypt. God has blessed them. God has annihilated the Egyptians. God has fought battles with them. Uh, the plagues have come on Egypt, and you'll find here they are. Now, God says, I want you to go into the promised land, and they won't go. They're afraid. Why? They're faint-hearted. Why? They knew who God was, but they had a wrong understanding of who he is. And they didn't have faith in him at all when he said something. Numbers, the 14th chapter, verse number 3. Just pop it up. We're talking about being faint-hearted. Listen to this. Numbers 14, verse number 3. Just pop it up and it says, why has the Lord brought us? They're complaining to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and children should become victims. Would it not be better for us to go and return to Egypt? Why? They're now faint-hearted in their decision-making process. When you are faint-hearted in your decision-making process, you are out of sync with God. And how you got faint-hearted is, number one, you don't understand a true understanding of who he is. You've entered into fear, and now you're making decisions with a faint heart, and you'll never make the right decisions. Is anybody listening? Yes. Now... Here's something else that's kind of fascinating. If the, if the process is working, number one, he has, uh, he's finds himself lack of true understanding that brings him fear, and fear that brings him to faint-heartedness, and now faint-heartedness brings him to unfaithfulness. And when you're unfaithful, now you have no decisions whatsoever to make. In fact, Luke, the 16th chapter, verse 12, just popped up on overhead, says these words. If you, having been faithful in what is another man's, or not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what's your own? So now the process starts. Here's, here's this guy with one talent. He buries it. He's cursed by the master, all because, number one, he did not have a true understanding that brings and brought him to a place of fear. Fear brought him to faint-heartedness, Faint-heartedness brought him to a place of unfaithfulness, and unfaithfulness brings you to a place, if you will, of unfruitfulness. Unfruitfulness brings you to a place of excuses. And that's exactly what was lined up in this man's life. All because he missed understanding that you cannot miss with God. If you stay with God. Let's go back, if you will, to Matthew, the 25th chapter. Matthew, the 25th chapter. Take a look with me, if you will. In verse number 27, he says, And so you ought to have deposited the money with the bankers, and that in my coming that I would receive back my own with interest. Therefore, take the talent from him who gave it to him and give it to the ten talents. Wait a minute. He's going to take from the one and give it to the guy with 10. That doesn't make any sense. That's not the American way of doing it. The American way of doing it is you take from the rich and tax them and give it to the poor. Sorry, that was political, and I don't ever go political. But it is. It's so true. Now, this process that we're reading right here, it's very, take from the talent from him and give it to him who has 10 talents. He didn't give it to the guy who had two. He gave it to the guy who had 10. Why? Because the guy who had 10 makes it work. 
Think about it like this. I've said this before as an illustration. If you had a stockbroker and you gave him $10,000, and you went to another stockbroker and gave him $10,000, you had two stockbrokers. One took the first stockbroker, took your $10,000, and made $50,000 out of it. The second stockbroker that you gave $10,000 to, he, he, he took your $10,000 and he lost it for you. Or maybe went down to 5,000, or even stayed at 10. Then what would you do with the remaining 10,000 that the second stockbroker had? Leave it with him, or get it out of his hands and put it in the hands of the guy that can make something out of it. And that's what takes place here is that God is taking it out of the hands of the one who is a slothful servant and putting it in the hands of somebody to do something with it. That's God's way of doing things. Are you following me? It doesn't seem very American, but it is. It's very God, not American. Verse number 29 comes along, and he says it like this. Just pop it up. So, for everyone who has, more will be given. And he will have an abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. Now, that's a bizarre verse and does not fit into our political system in America. But that's what God says as an economic understanding. You don't give to somebody who doesn't do anything with it. You give to somebody who's going to do something with it. And somebody that isn't going to do something with it isn't going to do something with it, but somebody who is going to do something with it is going to take it and multiply it. And he says it just as simple as this, for everyone who has, in other words, everyone who's been given a talent by God, listen to this, and goes out and does something with it, he says this, he will give him an abundance. But for him who does not have, in other words, he buries it, he's in fear, he doesn't understand God, he doesn't see God as one who can bring it back to him, he's, uh, he's making bad choices, he's faint-hearted, he's unproductive, he's unfruitful, oh my goodness. He's making excuses. I just can't. He says, for everyone that has not, even what he has will be taken away. Now, the worst part of all of this is verse 30. Verse 30 says, and cast the unprofitable servant in the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's like Jesus coming up to a fig tree. Looks at the fig tree. The fig tree at that time of year should have been full of figs wasn't and what Jesus does when he sees the fig tree that should have been full of production that had no production as you know the story he cursed it his disciples and him walked back but the next day they come back and that that fig tree is all shriveled up it's amazing miracle because you and I are required by God by whatever it is that we get your home your children your marriages Hey, your finances, whatever the talent is that God gave you that is worth something to you, you have got to steward it the right way. Because if you don't steward it the right way, it'll be taken from you and given to somebody who will steward it the right way. And that's the shock of the whole thing, and that's not fun for anybody. And so this all boils down to what are you going to do with what you have? Are you going to trust God? Or are you going to let fear come in? Are you going to really understand that God's a God who reaps where he hasn't sown? You may think that's unjust, but it's all his, you see. It all belongs to him, whether he sowed it or not, he reaps. He gathers and he hasn't scattered seed. Why? Because he's God. He's not waiting for the, you know, the earth to sprinkle water. He's God. He's not waiting for the rain to come. He's God. And he has given you something, and now you have got to take what it is he's given you and believe God for it. And you have got to put it to work to do something that's going to make life better and do what God would have you. And it's not just better for you. Do you know the servant that was, you know how he calls him an unjust steward? He calls him a, what was the words he used? Does anybody remember? A wicked and lazy, what? servant. Why would he call him wicked? Because when you're supposed to be doing the best interest for the master and you don't do the best interest for your master, you are a wicked and lazy servant. That's like saying I'm working when my job, my boss is looking at me, but when he's not looking, who cares? This is not my business. 
I'll just get my paycheck at the end of the week. And that's wickedness. So for all of us, everybody in here, you are at least a one-talent person. Debbie and I have said that all of our lives. We're a one-talent people. Well, we're not going to take our one talent and bury it. We're going to do something with it. We're going to make sure that it benefits the master. You follow me? And then he does what? He takes from those that don't benefit and gives back more to those that do benefit. And that's the way economic stewardship works. And so for all of us that are in here, it's your call. You don't have to do anything. Keep on living the way you're living. Or get in line and get in tune with what God is saying. Everybody's at least a one-talent person. Everybody. Some of you even might be two, and some of you might be three. And it's your call to ask whether or not you're going to do something that's going to glorify and build up the master. It's all his anyway. Come on, if God spoke to you tonight, give him a great big praise the Lord. Here's the process once more time. <clears throat> <clears throat> when you have a lack of true understanding about God, listen to me, it'll bring you to fear. Fear will bring you to faint-heartedness. Faint-heartedness will bring you to... Unfaithfulness. Unfaithfulness will bring you to unfruitfulness and cause you to live a life of excuses. It's that simple. Did I, put, did I put that on the overhead? Lack of true understanding brings us to fear. Fear brings us to faint-heartedness. Faint-heartedness brings us to unfaithfulness. Unfaithfulness brings us to unfruitfulness. And unfruitfulness brings us to excuses. And that's why he said, you're a hard man. You sow where you have not reaped. Is anybody listening? Yes. Your call. Just want to make sure everybody's all right with God before you leave because it would be terrible for you to come into here and not be right with God. So let's get right with God tonight. You know, some of you that are in here, if you die, you're going to go to hell, and you don't want to do that. And somebody needs to love you enough and respect you enough and honor you enough to tell you the truth. You know, I don't want to blow smoke and incense all over you and let you walk out of here. I want to tell you the truth. If you die, you're going to go to hell unless you get right with God. Now, let me tell you something. A lot of people think, 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 with their head that they're right with God, but you don't get right with God because you think you're right with God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. You can't get to the Father any other way but his way. You can't get to the Father my way. You can't get to the Father your way. We can't get to the Father some well-meaning church committee's way. You're going to have to get to the Father his way. Jesus said that. And his way is very clearly outlined in Scripture. I'll share it with you in a moment. Some of you think you're okay with God because your mom and dad told you a Christian when you were a kid. Uh, could you show me that in the Bible? There's nowhere in the Bible that says your mom and dad tell you a Christian makes you a Christian. Put a cross St. Christopher around your neck. You know, take you to catechism class or Sunday school or Sabbath school class as a child. It's not in the Bible. You're not going to make it. Somebody needs to tell you. Some of you think you're going to make it to heaven because you're really a good person. Where in the world did you get that information? I'll tell you where, Hollywood, movies, scripts, all that kind of stuff. Those people that uh, make movies and television shows have uh, said if you're good enough, you'll make it in all their movies. They, they don't know how to get to heaven. You're only going to get to heaven Jesus' way, not Hollywood's way. And you, so you're not going to make it if you think you're going to get there because you're good enough to make it. Some of you say, wait a minute, I'm going to go to heaven because um, I really love God. Guess what? Nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to love God, you get to go to heaven. It's not in the Bible. You're not going to make it. Somebody needs to tell you. Some of you say, wait a minute, Pastor Jim, you don't understand. My, my mom and dad and had me uh, you know, baptized when I was a child and christened as a baby. Uh, I, I joined my last church. I was there for 14 years. It was a Christian church. I sang in the choir, helped the pastor out, taught a Bible 
college class or a Bible study class in my church. I know I'm a Christian. Great, because you taught that class, helped the pastor out, joined the church. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. Here's what Jesus said in order for you to get to heaven. His way, no other way. You must be born again. Now, most people who attend American churches don't even know what born again means. Some of you, when you hear the words born again, it turns you off. You know why? Because Hollywood's portrayed born again people as idiots, fanaticals, and radicals. And that's not what Jesus is talking about at all. He said you must be born again. And here's what born again means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. Let me tell you, it means you've given God all of your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. Listen to me now. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. One more time. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. I'll prove it to you by the word of God. Last book of the Bible, book of Revelation, Jesus is making a statement. Here's the proof. He says, I'm coming again and when I come I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm I will vomit you from my mouth. Do you know what he just really just said? He just said these words. People that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all and they're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. Let's define for you what lukewarm is. Tell me if this fits. Little in, little out. Little up, little down. Token prayer, occasional church attendance. Watch this. You're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Watch this. Here's lukewarm. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And the problem with that is he'll never be something until you make him everything. It's an all or nothing relationship. You've got to give him all of your heart. You've got to give him all of your life. And you notice how I emphasize the word give him? Because he's not a thief to rob it from you. It's your heart and life. He's not a conniver to talk you out of it. He's not a manipulator to make you do it. It's your heart and it's your life. So today, tonight, here we are in this safe, friendly place. Why not get right with God by giving God all of your heart, giving God all of your life? I already know you know who he is in your head. Yeah, you already know who he is in your head. You know you do. You celebrate Christmas and Easter every year of your life. You know who Jesus is. But that won't get you to heaven, what you have in your head. It's about what you've done with your heart. You must be born again. It means you've got to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. He won't steal it from you. It's your heart and life. You've got to make the choice. So all across this auditorium, you say, well, Pastor Jim, how do I get right with God? Well, let's get right with God God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up. And what you're saying by the raising of your hand is this. I don't want Jesus in my head like most Americans. I want to give him all of my heart, give him all of my life, be born again, headed for heaven, and denying my presence in hell. And I'll see your hand go up. He said, where? Before men. I'm a man. I'll see it. And when you raise your hand, I'll see that. And let me tell you something. You might be embarrassed for a moment because you're raising your hand, but get over it. It's better to be embarrassed in a safe place like this for a moment than to be in hell forever and ever because you are afraid of what people think instead of what God sees. So tonight is your night of salvation. You need to give God all of your heart. You need to give God all of your life. Somebody is telling you the truth. And the truth is, you got to give it to them. All. This is an all or nothing relationship. So if you've been running from God instead of to God, in a moment I'll pop my hands together and you get ready to put your hand up. If you've never given him all of your heart, you know who you are. Get ready to, when I hear that sound, put your hand up. You're one of those people that are in here and you haven't given him all of your life. When you hear that sound, get ready to put your hand up. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're not sure about where you're at, whether you've given him all of your heart and life, you know who he is, you've prayed to him, you've gone to church once in a while, you're really kind of a nice person, but you want to make sure you're headed for heaven and denying your presence in hell. Man, when you hear this, bang, you get your hand up all over this place. Are you ready? Here it is. I'm counting to three. I've done my job. Here it is all across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, in the foyer by television, wherever you're at. Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Thank you. There's one. Thank you. There's, God bless you. There's two. There's three. Thank you. Anybody else? Back over here. There's four. Thank you. There's five, six, seven, eight. Thank you. Back over here. Anybody else? There's eight wise people. Nine. Thank you. Back over there. Ten. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Real quick. Anybody else? You can put your hands down. I saw you guys. 
There's 10 wise people already. Anybody else? Real quick, you know you need to get right with God. There's another hand somewhere back here. Thank you, 11. God bless you, my friend. There's another one, 12. God bless you. See how easy this is? So easy, you can put your hands down. God bless you, I see you. There's 12 wise people. Anybody else? Where are you, 13, 14, 15? You know you need, thank you, 13. Thank you, where are you? There's 14. Where are you, 15? You know you need to get your hand up. This is the time. Don't miss this. Come on, anybody else? Come on, anybody else? Anybody else? There's 14 wise people. How about 15? Where are you? 15, you're saying to yourself, I wonder if I should do this. 15, back in the family room. God bless you. Anybody else? Real quick. Going for God. Let's go for God. If you haven't given God, 16. God bless you. You haven't given God all of your heart. You haven't given God all of your life. Thank you. That's so cool. 16 wise people. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? <gasps> okay, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 16 wise people. Here's what I want you to do. All 16 of you, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. I want you to get your stuff, get out of your seat, get in the aisle. All 16 of you. And anybody else, if you're number 17, 18, 19, 20, and you're thinking, man, I probably should have raised my hand and done this. Well, you can come too. Just nudge your neighbor and say, come on, I'll go with you if you need to go, because that's what this is all about. You're in a safe, friendly place. We love you. 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, wherever you're at, you just come. Let's stand and welcome them as they come. You come right now. Come on. 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 You raise your hand. Come on. Well, they're coming. Give them a hand as they come. Come on, you come too. Come on, come on. Well, only about 10 or 11 of you showed up. I hope the rest of you, you don't, listen to me, you don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by giving God all of your heart and all of your life. And if you can't stand up for God in a safe place like this, then how are you ever going to stand up for God in an uncertain world out there? So you got to start off the right way. I'm going to have David sing that song one more time. And if you raise your hand or if you know you should have, I know there's more of you that need to get out of your seat. You did raise your hand, but you're not coming. I just love you enough to just to prompt you to get your stuff, bring your kids if you need to out of the family room, wherever you're at, and you get down here right now. David, you sing that one more time for the people. You come right now. Come on. It's your mercy that draws me. Come on. By grace I'm standing here. No matter the road I walk, so love my wrong. I realize it's true. Come on. It's your mercy that draws me. Thank God you guys have come. Real quick, look over to your left. This is Pastor Dave. He's going to do three things. He's going to pray with you to invite Jesus into your heart. He's going to give you some free information. Second thing, help you to do what, what's next now that you're saved. And then thirdly, here's what he's going to do. It's really neat. He's going to introduce you to a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. You've heard of personal trainers that get you buff and physical, but these are spiritual people that meet you before church service. They're friends. Buy you coffee, tea, nachos, go over some scripture with you, help you get strong so you don't go back doing the same old junk you used to. Let us help you get strong. Here's why. You said you're going to give God all of your heart. You said you're going to give God all of your life. If you really mean that, then let us help you to get strong so you can go on with your life and be successful. Don't just come, pray this prayer, and get lost and fall through the cracks somewhere. Let us help you do that. Is that okay? Take a moment. And when people who came with, they'll wait for you. Just follow Pastor Dave right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. <clears throat>